so another week has gone by. Um, the beard has grown a little bit in the past week. Uh, we're still at home. Liz, you've been into the office this week. Lucky you. I have been into the office this week. So I've had a day trip, which was, uh, which was very welcome. Day trip. A <laughs> day trip, yeah, into the office. Uh, where they've got like a one-way system, I hear, now going around the office. So you can only walk in certain directions and they're taking half the chairs out. Yeah, we've introduced uh, an arrow system. So you can only go one way. So if you want to get anywhere, you have to leave a lot longer to uh, negotiate the office. I wonder whether the Queen's done the same at uh, Windsor Castle, where you've got a one-way system to, to serve her breakfast or bring her red boxes in the morning. You know, someone told me this week that uh, we've now been locked down for more days than you would uh, have been in the Big Brother house if you made it from the start to the finish. Well, OK, yeah. Well, that's, that, that feels like a long time, and, uh, and none of us are going to get celebrity contracts uh, at the end of it either. <laughs> Uh, although I'm sure Big Brother's um, passed its prime in any case now. So what's been going on in the, um, not the Big Brother house, what's been going on in the Royal House? In the Royal House, uh, again, another reasonably busy week. There was a... Zooms? Uh, any Zooms? Uh, yes, actually, a very good Zoom. There was a Royal Bingo Zoom this week. A Royal Bingo Zoom, yeah. I've got a question for you. What's six and two? Tickety-boo. There we are. As the Duchess of Cambridge knows very well. Yeah, she did well, didn't she? Uh, and speaking of the Duchess of Cambridge, there was uh, an article that was published in Tatler this week, a, a profile on Kate called Catherine mm. the Great that uh, Kensington Palace have taken uh, umbrage with and uh, put out a very strong statement denying a lot of the facts. That yeah, we'll talk about that because there's quite a lot to talk about in that one, isn't there? So uh, um, unusual for them to put out a statement. But anyway, we'll get to that. Uh, the Prince of Wales uh, was on Classic FM for two uh, evenings this week and uh, the Duke of Cambridge uh, took part in a BBC One documentary uh, about football and mental health and the team have been following him for a year uh, looking at his work around uh, football and mental health and his Heads Up campaign. Yes, and, and um, some of that documentary itself had to be truncated by the look of it at the very end and, and finished off on Zoom itself. So um, e even that wasn't immune from the lockdown. Yeah, and the only other uh, thing to mention is uh, Camilla's starring role in uh, a reading of James and the Giant Peach. Yeah, yeah that was good, that, wasn't it? Um, uh, Never before has a royal taken on a role in that way. The ship's captain, she was, uh, reading a passage uh, as they narrate James and the Giant's Peach to raise money for, for, for charity. Where do we begin then? Should we begin with the Duchess of Cambridge? And I suppose we could, could begin either on her, um, on her bingo calling or on the claims in the Tatler magazine. Where do you want to go? I think let's go Tatler first and then, uh, then we can come back to bingo. Well, let's go again. full on Tatler then. Okay, so... Now, so Catherine the Great, I mean, an interesting title. And actually, by and large, it was a, um, a pretty a positive article, wasn't it, um, written by their journalist. Uh, yet Kensington Palace obviously took um, issue with a couple of points in there. Uh, they didn't say which, but we're, we're presuming it's the bit of which where she says she feels like she's working as hard as a top CEO or she, the extra workload that she's had to take on since Harry and Meghan left they all came from unnamed sources or unnamed friends um and and a bit of a row erupted between tatler and kensington palace in their various statements they put out in the week that's right tatler claimed to have spoken to a friend of the duchess's saying that she's furious about a larger workload she feels exhausted and trapped she feels like she's working as hard as a top ceo that needs to be wheeled out um, and Kensington Palace came out and said, uh, like you say, without saying which bits they uh, disagreed with, but they said there were a swathe of inaccuracies and false misrepresentations which were not put to Kensington Palace prior to publication. So what happened to never explain, never complain? Um, that, the, the normal royal mantra of those things is we, we don't comment uh, this article, we don't comment on leaks or source quotes or all the rest of it. They, they clearly felt that this needed some sort of slapping down, whereas ordinarily uh, these articles get written all the time and, 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 and the palace don't comment. Yeah, they obviously felt so strongly that this needed to just be cut off before it could build any steam and be picked up 
widely that they were going to just cut this off completely. Yeah, but it was, I suppose it was like a profile of someone who's going to be a future king. And therefore, um, just as Prince Philip has been to the Queen as the consort, she's going to be the consort to King William one day. Uh, and uh, actually, King William the what? Do we ever work that out? King William the fifth? We have actually gone down that road. We haven't, have we? We must find that out, actually. I'm sure someone must know. Um, but when, when he's King William, um, she's going to be the consort. Now, I think the article was saying actually how supportive she is and how much actually William does... Uh, rely on her um, and how she she can help really and actually she's had a good if it's right to put it this way she's had a good lockdown you know and in terms of the clapping they've done for the carers and all the zoom calls that she's made to maternity staff or to certain schools or the bingo calling that will come on to shortly uh, I mean a lot of people would say that William and Kate have had quite a good lockdown and they are, like you say, a good team and they are very supportive of each other. In the documentary that we'll talk about later that William appeared in, um, talking about mental health, he says how much uh, Kate and uh, he, they support each other. They supported each other when they first had children. And um, I think the thing with Kate is that over the last few years, we've really seen her kind of grow and come into her own, particularly with the causes that she's supporting. You can tell that she really feels quite passionately about what she's working on, whether that's the early years or whether that's the mental health. So I was quite surprised to hear them saying that she feels trapped mm. and uh, furious about this workload. She seems to me quite passionate about the work that she's doing. And yeah, and there was, some, there was some other guidance, wasn't there, from Kensington Palace that, you know, of course she doesn't feel like she's working as hard as a lot of people, you know, not like frontline staff in the NHS at the moment, not like somebody who goes and mines coal every day uh, deep underground. Um, and and they, they were sort of quite, um, they were quite careful in the way in which they, that they, they didn't want to give the impression that, that Kate feels like that she's having a really hard time. Um, when a lot of workers at the moment having a really hard time. Um, and I, the people wouldn't perhaps take an issue with, you know, how is often the, the question I get in this role, what do the Royals do all day? I mean, um, you know, they are running charities that they're not just doing public facing things all the time. There's plenty of work that they do that ever, you know, never makes it onto a television camera or, or, or into newspaper print. Um, but I thought perhaps that was the, the issue that they were most worried about was that Kate claiming that she's basically working too hard. Not that she claimed it, sorry, sources claimed in this tablet article that Kate apparently thinks she might be working too hard. Let's get this right. The other thing I think surprised me that um, they claim to have sort of spoken to Lots of friends of the Duchesses. Well, Kate and William notoriously have a very tight circle of friends that are very discreet and are very closed. And I think that's that's why they're they're friends with them. Mm. So I was quite surprised that they had uh, that they claimed to have spoken to so many friends that were being quite so sort of loose lipped. Yeah, I thought that was unusual because you don't see that very uh, often. Uh, so, so I mean, the, the, perhaps. Tatler did get some fantastic access, uh, who knows, but it, I think I would agree with you, it's very unusual for their friends to do any form of talking. And there was like insights into uh, William's relationship with Kate's family, wasn't there? And how uh, close uh, he feels to, to Michael and Carol Middleton, um, Kate's uh, mum and dad. And uh, yeah, I, I agree with you, I think it was quite unusual about the, 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 the the inside track that they had got was perhaps what made it very interesting and perhaps what worried Kensington Palace enough to put out a statement. But then Tatler put out their own statement afterwards in response, didn't they? They did. They said that they stood behind the reporting, that KP uh, knew that they were running the article and they were asked to work together with Tatler on it. And they said the fact they are denying they knew is categorically false. Mm. So it's soured relations there, I think, between that particular publication uh, and Kensington Palace but um, you know uh, that happens from time to time either they repair their relationships and move on or, or it festers for a while uh, often <laughs> often it can fester um, we certainly know from Harry and Meghan that they uh, uh, don't like the articles in particular publications and as we discussed on this very podcast how they've um, how they've cut them out of their of their workings now. Yeah, the, the other thing we should mention about the article is that there was uh, reports around the fallout between Kate and Meghan around the time of the wedding. And the I tights. think actually if, if those claims had been it, um, I'm not sure Kensington Palace maybe would have got involved. I think yeah. 
probably let that lie and let that run its course. I think it was more to do with uh, with her approach to work and her workload. Yeah, this goes back to the, 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 the newspaper claims just around the time of Harry and Meghan's wedding where Meghan made Kate cry. Uh, again, claims denied by both sides, etc. But uh, this article suggested or claimed that the confrontation came... <laughs> It sounds odd to say this, isn't it? It's such an important time in the world uh, over whether or not the bridesmaids should wear tights. Yeah, it was uh, during the wedding rehearsal, they say that um, Kate wanted the children to wear tights and Meghan didn't because she said it was too hot. I mean, you know. yeah. So when you actually say these words out loud, um, you know, given where the world is at the moment and all the important things going on, you do sort of wonder sometimes about the 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 the, the, the level of the uh, detail in, in in these conversations and and whether or not we should be even talking about it. Um, continuing with Kate, uh, I mean, she might be working as hard as a CEO, according to some sources claimed in the magazine. Uh, but actually, if she were to get a job, she wouldn't do too badly getting a job as a bingo caller. I don't think either of them did too badly, did they? <laughs> so this was a call that they did, another Zoom call back in their uh, usual room with a background slightly similar to yours, slightly similar colour. Mm. Um, uh, this, were... this is my inner, inner William and Kate look. <laughs> Although, as we will discuss, actually, we have, we've seen, we think we've seen another corner now of... Um, of Anne the Hall in, in another Zoom video, but we'll come to that. Um, so they were calling uh, care workers around the UK to thank them for the work that they're doing mm. around coronavirus. And during one of the calls to Shire Hall Care Home in Wales, they, uh, they played bingo with some of the residents there, which was brilliant. Yes, uh, very good, wasn't it? Uh, particularly, um, I was wondering whether Kate wouldn't be able to get the sort of uh, the, the bingo lingo, as it is called, and um, either she researched it in depth beforehand, or she already knew that six and two was tickety boo, and um, uh, or one of the others. Actually, are you, have you got a list there? You seem ah. to be reaching for a list. I have. Let's see. If, are these these ones weren't in the um, the royal okay. bingo. Uh, Winnie the Pooh. Winnie the Pooh, 32? Mm, close, 42. Okay. Uh, let's try this one. Garden Gate. Garden Gate, um, 68? Just eight. Okay, you must know okay. this one. Two Little Ducks. Uh, two Little Ducks, 22. Yes. Well done. Um, uh, pick and Mix. Pick a mix. No idea. No. 26. Pick a mix, 26. Right, okay. <laughs> Two <laughs> fat ladies. Uh, is that 88? Hey, well done. So yeah. actually, um, uh, we, we've shown ourselves to be quite inept at uh, bingo lingo. Um, let's, <laughs> let's, have a, let's, have, <laughs> let's have a listen to Kate do it. Catherine's going to pick out the first ball. Okay. So the first number is five and eight. 58. One little duck, number two. <laughs> Eight and seven, 87. Six and two, tickety boo. Of course, with any uh, bingo game, there's always a winner. Someone gets full house first. Um, it was Joan, wasn't it, on this occasion in this particular care home in Wales who got the full house? Yeah, Joan, Joan won, but um, we might have been impressed with Kate and William's bingo calling. Yeah. I'm not sure Joan. Joan. No. Yay! Yay! You won the bingo. I just won. Oh. Hi, Joan. Hello, Joan. Well done. How are you? We're very well, thanks. How did we do a bingo? Was it okay? Yeah, very good. It wasn't as good as it should have been. <laughs> <laughs> So Joan wasn't impressed, um, how, however, uh, I mean, I think a lot of the frontline staff working in that care home were uh, very appreciative of the call they got from, from uh, Anne Mahal, from William and Kate, and they spoke about the, you know, the challenges of providing PPE and supporting one another and the mental health implications of looking after residents in care homes, which as we know, not just in this country, but in many countries have been really hardly hit by coronavirus. And I think we were talking, earlier about 
what the purpose of royals is and it's to highlight uh causes and things but it's also to you know they gave they gave a real boost to those care workers mm. residents at that home by spending some time with them talking to them and hearing about you know the good times and the bad times the, the home said it had managed to stay very positive and they were managing to have fun during the the uh, outbreak but that things of course were tough and that you know working in the ppe was yeah challenging. And you can see from the pictures they're working in PPE. And I think the slightly wider point is that, that you know, whereas a lot of the focus uh, in this country has been on hospitals and on the uh, NHS, the National Health Service, um, care homes and staff in care homes feel like they haven't quite got that recognition. So I think to, to get that in such a big way from William and Kate, and that got quite a lot of coverage, didn't it? Um, the picture of Kate holding up. The, uh, the bingo balls um, was very good for them. And this is the conversation that they had with some of the care home workers about the challenges that they face. How have you and the team managed to look after yourselves and your own mental health and kind of things with this? Because obviously you're, you're doing a lot more hours, you're a lot more involved, I guess, than, and, and are there a lot more. It's <laughs> very hot <laughs> in all of it, yeah. <laughs> but the morale in the home is lovely. It is. You know, it is a positive daily life for Chaya Hall. I've never known Welsh people not to know how to have fun. <laughs> I know. So frontline staff have got their own challenges, but actually uh, William's father, Prince Charles, was this week highlighting another challenge, perhaps one that we don't really think about. Maybe it's because it's in an industry or a, a sector that's often considered to be quite elite, but he was talking about the creative arts and, uh, sector, like orchestras and uh, all those sort of things, ballet and all the rest of it that, that's... Um, they're struggling at the moment because theatres, concert halls are all closed. Um, they're all, you know, most of them are charitable endeavours. In any case, they're, they're losing money. They're running out of cash. In fact, there was one establishment in London that said, you know, they might have to stay closed until next year because they simply don't have the cash to, to open at the moment. And uh, it was on a radio station, a classical musical radio station. If you're not in the UK, it's known as Classic FM. And uh, that was a... Prince Charles basically did his own show. He did one interview with, with a chap called Alan Titchmarsh. Again, if you don't know him, he's a famous gardener in the UK, but also a lover of classical music. And we know that Prince Charles likes his classical music. And um, as he said on Classic FM, he quite likes to play it in the car. On the CD thing in the car. On, on the CD thing in the car, which I think we'd all say is the CD player. I know, I really love that bit. It was very... <laughs> <laughs> Maybe he'll move on to Spotify or streaming at some point, but at the moment he's still got a, quote, CD thing in his car. I mean, you could tell from his interview with Alan Titchmarsh just how passionate he is about the arts. And he's, he's patron a lot of a lot of these organisations. Mm. So he's really concerned that the industry is, as he says, completely silent and unable to operate at the moment. And they're going to have to find a way to support these organisations to ensure that the industry survives coronavirus and can come back from this. We talk at a very difficult time um, for nations right across the world, but the UK has been particularly badly hit by COVID-19 and, and the virus has had a particularly devastating effect and looks as though it's going to have a prolonged effect on the arts world, hasn't it? Well, yes, this is the, the desperate thing. I mean, I'm, as you probably know, I'm president or patron of a, a large number of orchestras and, um, you know, conservatoires, the Royal Ballet, the Royal Ballet School and uh, opera and everything else. And um, I mind a great deal about them and I spend a large proportion of my life trying to help them survive or raise money or whatever. So... Over the years, I've I've arranged you know gala concerts and events at Buckingham Palace and elsewhere to try and help all these great arts institutions, which are so utterly vital to this country and are, I think play such a huge part in in um, cultural diplomacy. But at the moment, of course, they're they're completely silent and unable to operate, unable to work, and I. I you could imagine, from the point of view of their livelihoods and their futures, what on earth are we going to do, let alone trying to find a way of keeping these these orchestras and other uh, organisations, arts bodies going? I mean, only today I, I was hearing that the Royal Opera House, which I've been patron for, uh, and, the, and the chorus and orchestra for 45 years, 
and love going there more than anything since I was seven years old. Um, they're in terrible difficulties, of course, because how are they going to be able to restart? It, it is a very expensive art form, but is is crucial because it has such a, you know, a worldwide impact and our reputation in this country with music and the quality of music and singing and everything else is 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 very high and so we have to find a way to make sure these marvelous people and organizations can survive through all this and he's patron of not just organizations in in the capital in london but also you know similar organizations in wales and scotland and northern ireland uh, as well and he's clearly very con concerned about it isn't he and, and, and about the impact that coronavirus is, is going to have and just how long it's going to take for them to to rebuild themselves yeah, sadly, I think it's like many industries that are going to be really affected by coronavirus and it's going to take a lot of work to ensure that we protect and, uh, you know, allow these industries to come back. Now, the reason why he spoke about the CD thing in the car was because uh, he was talking about how Wagner is a difficult composer to like. Um, but the more you listen to it, the more you warm to it. And he was talking about some of his police protection officers and where he played Wagner so often on the CD thing in the car that actually his police protection officers grew to like the composer in the end. Sounds like a very civilised way to travel, doesn't it? Around the country, <laughs> listening to Wagner with your police officer. It's, it's really cute. Well, he is the, the heir to the throne, I suppose, if you expect anyone to be sort of like gliding around the country with a police escort with no traffic lights and all the roads open to you uh, whilst listening to classical music, where well, you'd expect that from Prince Charles, wouldn't you? Oh, but yeah, like you said, it was really sweet that, you know, he played it so much that it just became familiar to, to this police officer. So he grew to, grew to love it. I'm accompanied by... by um kind policemen who look after me all the time, wherever I go. And I used to play Wagner, um, some of the operas on the, the um, you know, the uh, machine and the CD thing in the, in the car. And the person I had with me at the time long ago had never heard Wagner before in his life because I played it on various occasions in the car. He, he grew, can you believe it, to love it so much that he then became a Wagner fan, having never heard it before, and presumably having also thought, well, it's not for me, you know what I mean. So it is, it's familiarity, I think, which in this case doesn't breed contempt. It, it breeds real devotion, I've heard. And he likes classical music so much that actually he's... Uh often suggested pieces of music that certain high-profile people, such as his sons, should have at their weddings. Yeah, he said that he loves suggesting pieces of music, trying to organise uh, music, um, which obviously came in very helpful for Prince William to have a father that's so uh, knowledgeable. Yeah, when you've got millions of people around the world watching your wedding, it's quite good to have uh, some music. But it wasn't just William's wedding. Uh, when was that? Back in 2011 um, at Westminster Abbey, but also Harry and Meghan's wedding in 2018, um, just over two years ago now, because we discussed their anniversary last week, didn't we? Um, that he's, he, It was Prince Charles, for example, who suggested the Kingdom Choir. I think a lot of people just presumed it was Meghan that suggested it, but Prince Charles has a lot of connections in this... Uh, sector and it was the kingdom choir that famously sung stand by me uh, at the wedding and we spoke to them didn't we at around the time of Meghan and harry um leaving the the royal family and their success has been absolutely phenomenal since that wedding yeah it's been uh, astonishing the success they've had and it just shows i mean the, the profile you can get from doing something like the or singing at a royal wedding but I think uh, Charles, actually, it was quite sweet talking about William, but he also talked about memories of his grandmother taking him to Covent Garden to see the Bolshoi Ballet when he was seven. And he said that he was just completely inspired by that mm -hmm. moment and that his sort of love had grown, grown from there and that it's you know, important that grandparents and relatives take children of a similar age to go and sort of experience the arts and... Um, and like him, get inspired by it. 
Yeah, but I mean, I suppose the trouble there is that, that, you know, that not everyone has a grandmother who happens to be Queen Elizabeth, the Queen Mother, and gets to see the Bolshoi Ballet uh, at age seven, at wherever he went somewhere in, in London. To most people, that is completely out of their reach, isn't it? And um, uh, I, I suppose what, what wasn't necessarily... Um, addressed in that conversation he had was access you know how do you widen access to that that kind of um performances to to people who wouldn't ordinarily go and see the Bolshoi ballet at age seven i know i didn't and um i suspect most seven-year-olds also don't meet the cast straight after the performance <laughs> yes yeah but um i guess it's just raising the point isn't it that we should yeah. be looking at ways to introduce children to the arts at a young age and that's you know a challenge and it will be even more of a challenge post coronavirus because obviously the industry you know will need to be making money and um to survive and whilst he was doing that chat with alan titchmarsh um he did it from burke hall from his study uh, we got a bit of an insight didn't we into um how he works and that is <laughs> lots of bits of paper at his desk it was messier than mine that's for sure Oh my goodness, I don't know how he could see the wood from the trees. There were just papers everywhere. There was, you know, notes scribbled in red pen, things crossed out, things piled up on each other. I mean, yes, even <laughs> messier than you on a busy day. Yeah, we, we heard Camilla say, didn't we, a couple of weeks ago that um, her husband is a workaholic. Well, th there's your proof. Um, again, uh, we're not talking about working on the front line of the NHS. We're not talking about working in a coal mine, to go back to what uh, Kate was saying earlier. But um, that, that was a busy desk with a lot of paperwork on it. A very busy desk. But I always love looking around at the photographs they have up to see, uh, to see what they have. And he had a couple of pictures of uh, the Duchess. Um, he had the Queen Mother, and there was a picture in the, the background of uh, a very little Prince George, and I think he was in the red shorts that he was wearing for Princess Charlotte's christening, it looked like. Not sure that is like, <laughs> that's, that's some amazing knowledge. That's I was wondering where that. you were going with that, and that's pretty good. Uh, he had a rainbow up, which is obviously the symbol yeah. uh, of sort of Thanking our NHS. Do you think his grandchildren painted that rainbow or do you think he uh, drew it himself? Uh, well, we know he loves painting, but um, uh, I, I'm sure, I don't think it was him. Uh, what else? Well, he had a very <laughs> he likes painting. We're not sure he likes painting rainbows. He had a very good uh, gadget to hold his um, to hold his iPad up. Which... Yeah, a little, like a little sort of Perspex thing, didn't it? Um, which is what I thought quite interesting, where Alan Titchmarsh was... Um, sat there having their chat for Classic FM, but uh, yeah, it, it, it was um, quite an interesting insight into their life. I was wondering actually at what point, because I know how much um, Camilla and Charles like the countryside and all the rest of it, but at what point do they get a bit fed up of being at Burke Hall? At what point do they say, oh God, I wish we decided to spend the lockdown in Highgrove, or I wish we'd stayed at Clarence House for the lockdown. I mean, uh, I'm sure everyone's getting a bit bored of their surroundings, but I wonder what, what, at what point that feeling hit Charles and Camilla? Well, I mean, we've said this a couple of times on the podcast in previous weeks. I mean, they really have picked an absolutely beautiful setting mm. to have spent their lockdown. I mean, the Balmoral estate is um, huge, vast, but also really spectacular and very beautiful. And, you know, they will have plenty of, plenty of different walks that they can go on every day. So I think they've, uh, I think they've chosen quite well. Yeah. Um, nevertheless, the weather's not, I've noticed actually in some of the pictures that we've had from Burke Hall, never, not been as nice as it has been in the rest of the country. So um, Scotland's not well known for its blue skies and sunshine. And uh, I've noticed it's been definitely a lot cooler and greyer where he's been. So um, maybe they're looking on at the rest of uh, the rest of the country w with envy. Um, it's nevertheless... It's probably ideal for gardening though which we know that they both really enjoy so maybe ideal for gardening uh, ideal for walking the dogs uh, up on those beautiful hills in, in in Aberdeenshire um but it was also from where Camilla decided to play the part of the ship's captain in Raoul Dahl's James and the Giant's Peach anyone who's read that book uh will know about the the flying peach through the sky and Camilla um, took part, didn't she, with, with a couple of other... Well, she's, she follows some famous people, Meryl Streep being one, Ryan Reynolds being another, Benedict Cumberbatch, and, and now it was the turn of Camilla to do some acting. Yeah, and this is for um, the Roald Dahl Story Company, which uh, the little series of episodes is raising money to help charities impacted 
by coronavirus and it seemed an appropriate one for the Duchess to get involved in. She's patron of Royal Dahl marvellous children's charity. We know she's a huge supporter of children's literacy. That's very a very important cause to her. So it seemed like a, a good one for her to, to get involved in. Yeah, and um, we should listen to her acting. She was talking to a, a New Zealand actor and narrator, and here is the the part that they that she played uh, in. I think it was called episode six, wasn't it, of this uh, of this YouTube recording of James and the Giant Peach. Neither James nor any of the others knew it, but the ship that was now passing beneath them was actually the. Queen Mary sailing out of the English Channel on her way to America. Do you want me to do captain? I did this morning. Who did you do it with? Hello, Tyker. Hello. Thank you so much for doing this. No, I'm thrilled to do it. Not without much of an actor, but I shall do my best. <laughs> me neither. Here we go. On the bridge of the Queen Mary, the astonished captain was standing with a group of his officers, all of them gaping at the great round ball hovering overhead. I don't like it, the captain said. No, do I, said the first officer. Do you think it's following us, said the second officer. I tell you, I don't like it. It could be dangerous, the first officer said. That's it. It's a secret weapon. Holy cats, send a message to the Queen at once. The country must be warned. I think we did rather well. Didn't think we do badly at all. And the money from that will go to uh, a charity which helps provide protective equipment to frontline workers around the world, particularly in vulnerable communities where it might not be readily um, available. So uh, worth having a listen and a donate on YouTube if you so wish. Uh, let's move on to, to William's documentary then, uh, quite a big documentary that was on BBC One this week, uh, quite revealing in some parts about mental health and, and quite uh, what uh, William thinks about coronavirus and particularly men's mental health how suicide is the biggest killer of young men. A lot of very serious uh, subjects tackled in this documentary and very important ones that need to be aired, particularly at this time. Yeah, William uh, has a campaign called Heads Up, which is all about raising awareness, particularly for, uh, for mental health, particularly for men. And they're using football as a way of kind of starting a conversation about mental health. Uh, in men because obviously it's very popular it's a way of men coming together whether as fans or as uh, players and this documentary has been following him for a year and uh, looking at uh, various levels of uh, football uh, from club level right up to the very top of the game uh, to see you know what can be done and what is being done at the moment. As pain and grief goes and I've heard this from sadly too many families who have been bereaved by suicide. It is one of the rawest forms of grief because you're left with so many unanswered questions. Could I have done more? Should I have done more? And one of the players he spoke to was Marvin Sordell, who's a former England under-21 uh, soccer player, if you're listening to this in the US, or a football player, if you're listening in the UK. Um, and Marvin was uh, talking to William about his own mental health issues, his own depression and his own attempt at suicide uh, and uh, we uh, spoke to him on ITV on our uh, breakfast show Good Morning Britain and this is what Marvin said. I've been very open about that experience and, and my whole experience with depression and, and a suicide attempt as well because I think it's very, it's very important to see that you can overcome it, you can get to a better place. You know, I was in a very, very dark place in a deep hole and where I'm in life today, I'm a very happy person. And it was in that uh, conversation he was having with Marvin that they talked about the life-changing experience of having children and how for William that had brought back a lot of emotions for him that he'd felt following the death of his mother Princess Diana and he was talking about how you know it was an amazing but quite scary experience and that he and Kate had really supported each other during that time. I grew up without my father and I've not had a father to look up at and now I've got a child, you know, looking up at a father and I don't really know how I'm dealing with this and I really struggled with my emotions at that time and yeah. that's something that I wanted to ask you as well, you know, there's a lot of pressure, you know, for 
so many dads and so many men across the country. When you're struggling, who do you go to? Where do you go? Yeah, so I mean, I, I can relate to what you're saying, Marvin. I mean, having children is, you know, the biggest life-changing moment. It really is. And I, I agree with you. I think when you've, when you've been through something traumatic in, in life, and that is, like you say, your dad not being around, my mother dying when I was younger, your emotions come back in leaps and bounds because it's, it's a very different phase of life and you're not, there's no one there to kind of help you. And I definitely found it very, you know, at times overwhelming. Um, me and Catherine particularly, we support each other and we go through th those moments together and we kind of evolve and, uh, and learn together. But I do agree with you. I think emotionally things come out of the blue that you don't ever expect or that maybe you think you've dealt with. Um, and so I can completely relate with what you're saying about you know, children coming along. It's one of the most amazing moments of life, but it's also one of the scariest. Um, just say so your, your dad will be very proud of you. Now, we all have issues with uh, eyesight. Um, I, for one, wear contact lenses. You, you wear contact lenses. Uh, so William explained in this documentary that he also wears contact lenses, but, but he sometimes takes them out. Oh, this was before he needed uh, contact lenses and he couldn't see the people looking back at him when he's making his feet. Weirdly, the, the sort of thing that helped me, which I didn't actually realise at the time, was um, I'm now wearing contact lenses. Yeah. My eyesight started to sort of tail off a little bit as I got older. <laughs> okay. And I didn't used to wear contacts when I was working. So actually when I gave speeches, I couldn't see anyone's face. What? And it helps because it's just a blur of faces. Quite a good trick really, isn't it? Just everything becomes a blur and you can't see all those individual faces looking up at you. Yeah, but, but also, I mean, some of the newspapers made, made the connection between his great-grandfather, King George VI, and the, and the anxiety that he had. I mean, I think that's probably not that... Um, the, the, the connection isn't that great, maybe. His, his grandfather, great-grandfather, had a, had a really bad stammer, and famously they made a film about the King's speech, as many people will know. Um, but I think it at least showed that, you know, despite being a royal, despite being a football player, um, you know, anxiety happens, mental health happens. And, and I think um, that was the point that he was trying to make there, wasn't it? Yeah, it's the, the challenges that we all face, whether you're Prince William and a royal and making speeches all the time, um, you still feel, you can still feel anxious. Yeah, uh, and um, we're anxious that uh, that you might have had enough of us talking. So if you have got your eyes in, your contact lenses, your glasses, you can find the sort of off button. That's what we're about to do now, wherever this is on this Zoom call. Um, we can't give you a list of what's happening next week because we don't know. Mm -hmm.